Hi, my name is Lisa Brown and this is Nosset Educational Diversity Television. I'm here today with Honors Erd, uh, exploring and respecting differences. We have Irene, Bethy, David, and Ian here today and we're going to talk about immigration. So we know that uh, immigration is kind of a hot topic these days, uh, politically and in the United States, so our Honors Erd kids decided to uh, do topics in immigration and I'd like to start with um, Bethy and Irene. Uh, you guys did um, looking at sort of a timeline and kind of getting a sense of where we've come in our immigration um, over the last, I don't know, couple hundred years I think is where you started. Yeah. So, so why don't you take it away here. Okay, so the first date we're going to talk about is 1790 and this is right after America gained its independence from England and Congress passed the first law regarding immigration and it was called the Naturalization Act of 1970 and it allowed only free white men of good character who have been living in the United States for two years or longer to apply for citizenship in the United States. So really they were only allowing a s really slim amount of people to become U.S. citizens from who weren't like already living in the U.S. So it wasn't like a very open opportunity to a lot of people. And then the next important date after that is 1882, and this was the Chinese Exclusion Act. And I'm sure most people know what this is, but it was um, the U.S. barred Chinese immigrants from entering the United States. Um, the act is the first in American history to place um, broad restrictions on certain groups trying to immigrate into the United States. And... Um, Chinese immigrants worked in the gold mines and garment factories, built railroads, and took agricultural jobs. And Chinese immigrants make up only about 0.002% of the United States population. So it was just kind of like limiting the number more and more and just not letting a whole entire group of people not allowed to enter our country. So just to interrupt here for a second, so we're seeing that uh, after the first initial push of uh, people coming to this country, we've been relatively selective about yeah. who we've let in since then. Mm -hmm. um, what else do we have on this? So in January 1892, Ellis Island, the United States' first immigration station, opened in New York Harbor, and the first immigrant process was Annie Moore, a, teenage, a teenager from Country Cook, Ireland. Mm -hmm. More than 12 million immigrants would enter the United States through Ellis Island between 1892 and eight, 1954. And so I think it was like a really big step in immigration in the United States because it was like the first major place where all immigrants could go to get into the United States. And I think it was like an important place to a lot of people because it's where they kind of could get a new start when they entered the United States. Okay, so you've got our history up to Ellis Island. And so that's really where we formalized our immigration yeah. policy and we sort of funneled everybody into a system. Yeah. What else do we have here? So like during the time of Ellis Island in 1907, the U.S. immigration peaked. So there was a lot more immigrants entering our country than before. And in May of 1924, the Immigration Act of 1924 limits the amount of immigrants allowed in from a certain country. So it's like based on nationality quotas. So only like... 24% of immigrants can be from Ireland and only like 2% can be from like Asian countries and st stuff like that. So it kind of made it really hard for a lot of people to immigrate into the United States because if those quotas were already met, they really weren't allowed to come into the country no matter what. So the people of color that immigrated into the United States was limited pretty severely, yeah. but we had uh, uh, previous to that uh, a few hundred years before had uh, been taking uh, people from African descent here and enslaving them. Yeah, so that's exactly. where our black population originally came from. Um, but that, that didn't, um, that sort of stagnated and just stayed in country mm -hmm. and, and people who are now currently even from here, a lot of people have history of great-great-grandparents, et cetera, et cetera, who were people that were um, slaves. Yeah, and for the quotas, like, I would say about 75% of the people who are allowed to enter the United States were from, like, European countries and where, like, 
white people, so it was like pretty difficult for anyone who wasn't white to enter the United States. Okay, what do you have, Irene? What's uh, what's your what's your your part in this? Okay, um, so the first date I'll talk about is 1965. Is the Immigration and Nationality Act uh, overhauls the American immigration system, and the act ends the national origin quotas enacted in the 1920s that Bethy just talked about. Uh, which favored some racial and ethnic groups over others, like we said about the European groups over Asian groups or any pretty much anybody else. And the quota system repla uh, was replaced with a seven-category reference system, um, emphasizing family reunification and skilled immigrants. So this is the first time that I'm hearing skilled immigrants uh, into the country. So mm -hmm. that's kind of interesting. So we're, we're now sort of discerning and fine-tuning the kinds of people that we want in, in the country. Yep. Okay. Um, and then in mid-1980s, roughly 125,000 Cubans uh, seeked political, um, for, uh, political like, uh, asylum. asylum. Yeah, political asylum from Cuba. Good segue. Cuba. Oh. Wow. Yep. Okay. Um, and then in eight, uh, 1986, Ronald Reagan signs an act which grants pardons to more than three million immigrants living here illegally. So that was a place where we pardoned people that had come in, that had basically come in illegally. And does that mean that they snuck in or that they were here illegally and then they overstayed their visa? Do you know what that is or is that just, is it just general illegal? General illegal immigrants. Okay, okay. And then in 2001, um, the DREAM Act uh, for the for relief education of uh, alien minors does not pass Congress. And in 2012, President Barack Obama signs the DACA, which stands for Deferred Action for Child Arrivals, which temporarily shields dreamers from deportation, but does not lead a path to citizenship. So let me ask you about DACA. Does that mean kids who were born out of the country that came here as infants, or is that kids that were born in the country uh, to parents who are undocumented? I believe that it was people, kids who were born here. Okay. Who, to parents who are undocumented. Yes. Okay. And then in 2017, President Donald Trump issues a series of three executive orders aimed at curtailing travel and immigration from Muslim majority countries. And then all travel, all Trump travel bans were um, challenged in court. And in 2017 to present day, uh, President Donald Trump continues to try to tighten the uh, immigra uh, tries to tighten the border and deport illegal immigrants, and he's also trying to limit the number of immigrants entering the United States. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you for that history. Um, so that segues over to you, fellas. Uh, this is David and Ian, and um, you guys did. Um, uh, seeking asylum. So, mm -hmm. so that means that what we've seen is that historically uh, we've had um, a lot of people sort of filled the gap and came here and populated the country and then we started getting a little bit more and more restrictive as time went on uh, just so that there wasn't this kind of stampeded rush into the new country. Um, and we've become more and more selective about who we want and how we want them. Um, Okay, so uh, one of the ways that people come here is to seek asylum. Can you guys talk to that a little bit? Yes. So um, an asylum seeker is actually a word that's uh, interchangeable with a refugee. And somebody who's seeking uh, asylum is somebody who's coming to the U.S. on account of uh, one of the five bases. Um, those being uh, you're being prosecuted in your home country due to your race, religion, national origin, political opinion, or membership in a social group. So when people come to the U.S. seeking asylum, it's uh, to be let in. It has to be because of one of those five bases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, back in uh, 1961, it was finalized that uh, it's like a legal obligation for the U.S. If they uh, qualify by that definition as a refugee, uh, then we are mandated. Uh, it's mandated that we are required to take them in as a uh, refugee. So that's a very interesting point that uh, Ian brings up is that being mandated to take people as refugees means that if they're really, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a broad definition of what mm -hmm. asylum is. So, um, if, if you are uh, uh, 
fearing a gang membership, let's say in El Salvador or something like that, uh, or if you're fearing for your life or your family, if you're gay maybe, uh, whatever it might be in your home country, and uh, you're getting basically getting run out of town on a rail, mm -hmm. uh, we are obligated um, as a humanitarian country to take you. That's a very interesting point about the United States, which is probably why this issue gets so complicated so yeah. quickly. Uh, that's what happens a lot of the time whenever there's like, say like a major war going on, uh, there tends to be a large influx of uh, refugees seeking asylum in our country because uh, something like if their country is war-torn, uh, they don't feel safe or protected mm -hmm. in there, they are qualified to come uh, to the U.S. and mm -hmm. seek asylum. And this, of course, is not just the United States no, problem. No, yeah. Uh, a lot of European countries right. deal with this uh, right. as well. Right. Okay. So uh, can you talk a little bit more specifically uh, maybe about what seeking asylum uh, looks like? Maybe you have a story about it or is there... Yeah. Uh, okay. So a success story that I found uh, was a woman named Natalia. Uh, she lived in El Salvador, which we know is a fairly dangerous country. Uh, and so she was being threatened, her and her son uh, were being threatened by an El Salvadorian gang, uh, threatened to either join the gang or be killed. So they, uh, they fled El Salvador with like nothing but the clothes on their back. They went to Mexico uh, illegally there. Uh, they didn't have anything. But while they were there, they met some uh, U.S. lawyers. Uh, and there they were able to uh, file paperwork and uh, seek asylum in the U.S. And now they live here comfortably and safely. So that's a great success story, and it really helps to meet a U.S. lawyer, mm -hmm. no yeah, doubt. Very lucky. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Um, okay, so this is uh, Ned Rapp's Nosset Educational Diversity Television. My name's Lisa Brown, and we'll be right back. Okay, and we're back. This is Nosset Educational Diversity Television. My name's Lisa Brown, and we're here with Honors Erd class today. We're talking about immigration. We're talking about a little bit uh, about the history of immigration and what some of the troubles are. And uh, it's a hot button topic right now politically. So we're trying to sort of tease out uh, what some of the issues are and give you a little history around immigration. So uh, we're going to be welcoming back on the set now Declan and Becca and Andrew and Autumn. And uh, these guys have uh, done a little more research. We've just heard about the history and we've talked about a little bit around seeking asylum. Now we're going to be talking uh, a little bit about what happens when somebody overstays a visa, what those, what those situations are, um, and what happens when somebody does overstay a visa. So who'd like to start here? Andrew, would you mind giving a little history about what happens when you overstay a sure. visa? Um, well. I think first it might be best to start off by saying why people overstay visas and then build off Well, of let's actually talk about what visas people are overstaying. Do we know what, what uh, visas there are that we give out here in the United States? Well, there's typically a visa waiver program or acronym to VWP, and typically these are distributed to countries that are visa waiver program eligible. Um, which I believe is about a list of 20 or so countries in total. So does that mean, is that like Canada? In other words, you don't need a stamp to come in the country. You can just, you're, you're welcome to come in and out. But of course, you go through customs, but you don't have to apply for a visa in order to come visit us? Um, essentially. It's, it's a kind of complicated and wonky at times, but there's the visa waiver program and then the non-visa waiver program, which is a separate entity from itself as well. Okay, okay. Um, so, so what kind of visas do people typically come into the United States on? Um, typically, most people come in through the visa waiver program for various reasons, including wanting to start a family or visiting people. Um, however, visa waiver programs are separate from immigrant um, programs in the sense that those that apply for the visa waiver program are expected to leave after a set amount of time. Typically, this is about six months or so. Okay, so when I go visit another country, oftentimes it's as a tourist. So you're talking about somebody coming in on a tourist visa, for instance, right? Yes. Or, okay, so there's a tourist visa, and then there are student visas, right? 
Do we know much about student visas? Did you guys research any of the student visa stuff? Or um, I know a bit about it. I can say that out of those that o um, overstay their visas regarding student visas, about 39,000 or so students do end up staying overstaying their visas, which is a very large percentage of visa overstayers. Essentially, okay. a majority of people overstaying their visas are for education related. Are students or students that have been here and then s decide to stay and not renew their visas. Mm -hmm. Okay. What else do you have to add? Do you have anything that, you, um, that you'd like to add right now, Autumn, or are you... Yeah. Okay. Um, we can talk about the consequences of overstaying a visa. Oh, great. Okay. Which is actually pretty severe. Okay. A lot of times, even though overstaying a visa could be a clerical paperwork error. Um, In some cases, it is actually just a simple clerical pa paperwork error. Right. Right. So if you overstay your visa for more than 180 days, you can be barred from coming back into this country for up to three years. Um, and if you overstay for a longer period, for let's say a year, then you could be barred for up to 10 years. Wow. So if you have family here and you've actually created a life here, um, and depending on your situation, maybe overstaying your visa has been uh, a clerical issue. Right. Then you're talking about a pretty heavy severity of punishment for something that you could go like, for instance, um, sometimes I forget to, um, and I've done this, forget to get my car inspected. And that big sticker is all of a sudden the wrong color on the, you know, on the dashboard of my car. And I get pulled over by the cops. And they just remind me, you've got, you know, five days. How old school is that, looking at my watch for time? <laughs> you got, uh, I should be whipping out my phone. You've got five <laughs> days to, to, to get your stuff together to do that, right? Right. So do we have a program where people are stopped or maybe they've overstayed and they're like, bad person, you need to go and you have, you know, two weeks or a month or whatever to, to get your clerical paperwork together. Meanwhile, you can stay and keep your job and do your thing. Does that happen here? Um, there is a system in place where if you are caught without it, you're typically taken to be detained. Um, and under certain circumstances, you will have the option of renewing a visa. For majority of people, though, that's not particularly an option, and you are expected to renew your visa upon the cancellation, I guess, of it. So one of the things that I've heard is that because our reform, and because when we looked at our, I'm looking over here, when we looked at our history from our last guests that came on, uh, we are looking at the timeline of the history of immigration, um, we, we've put our immigration laws and reforms together kind of piecemeal so that sometimes all the pieces and parts don't add up. And so when they don't add up, there, is, there can be whole demographics of people that fall through the cracks and that their laws don't, the, the law doesn't apply to them where it does apply to them and it does apply to these people. And so in some instances, the immigration laws are a little selective a little too selective sometimes, maybe, um, because I mean it's it's because it's kind of a mess. We don't really have a comprehensive. We need a comprehensive overhaul, is what we're getting from all of our research that we found. What else do you have that you've done some research on here? Well, building off of what you just said, ex especially when visas, when someone is caught with an expired visa or such, there are certain exceptions that have been put in place for those that are eligible to renew their visas. Um, if you're caught um, and you're under the age of 18, you have the option of renewing your visa, as well as those that have asylum that is pending, as well as a pending green card, um, whether as well as the fact of whether or not you can prove the reason behind your overstaying is a connection with um, domestic abuse or such, as well as human trafficking. So there, there are there are comprehensive uh, reasons for why you can stay and renew. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we also know the TPS program, temporary protected status. Protected status. I know actually Haitian friends of mine that are on that right now. Mm -hmm. um, okay, do we have anything else to add? 
Yeah, um, this? unfortunately, if you do overstay your visa, it's very difficult to get it renewed, even if you leave the country one day after your visa expired. Um, the court proceedings that go through are much more difficult and you face a lot more resistance. And in some cases, if you try and resist leaving the country, even if you have a very good reason, like you're facing abuse or domestic violence or sex trafficking, you could actually have criminal proceedings brought up against you mm. and be barred from entering the country permanently. So some of these cases are as individual as the individuals. It usually depends on whether they have suspicion that maybe there's a drug cartel involved or something, but lots of times people are just resisting because they need to stay in this country for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And asylum has recently, under our new president, become increasingly harder to achieve. Um, so lots of times people just need to stay in this country and they can't seek asylum because it isn't covered under rules and regulations. Which brings us to DACA which brings us to really honing in now on um, kids, high school age kids, middle school, elementary school kids, and kids that um, are in college who are dreamers, who are kids that uh, were, you wanna, why don't you just actually talk about it so uh, right. you can give us a little background on DACA. So DACA, it's um, Deferred Action of Childhood Arrivals. And it's a type of administrative relief program that um, protects as eligible um, children who are immigrants who have been in this country for the majority of their lives, some brought while they were children and just grown up here thinking that they were U.S. citizens or even born in the country. Um, it protects them from deportation um, of all okay. instances. And um, it also grants... Um, especially for people that have grown up in this country and that are in their 20s, possibly 30s from, or it grants them work permits or um, educational opportunities. And okay. And what else do you have? Um, we do have, there's about a 96% approval rate into the program for um, people. You have to be under the age of 16 when you first came into this country to be able to be part of the program. And... Um, there was about, let's see, 25% of the recipients um, in 2019. The program started in 2012, but by today, about 25% have children that are U.S. citizens who have either one U.S. or one U.S. citizen parent, um, and they were born into this country and might not even know the um, aspects of their parents' immigration status. Status, yeah. So there could be kids. And correct me if I'm wrong about this. There could be kids who came here when they were three, four, five years old. And they came on a tourist visa or a work visa with their parents or something. And their parents decided to stay. Um, and of course, you know, parents are paying taxes and doing all of that. They have a social security number. Yeah. They pay taxes and everything, so, and they have a license. They get all the paperwork they need except for that visa piece. And the kid, and I know that this has actually happened here uh, in our region, maybe more than once for sure, um, the kid grows up here, um, basically even loses their accent from their home country, uh, considers themselves an American citizen, grew up from kindergarten, first grade, second grade, whatever, all the way through the system. Let's say they went to Brewster or Truro or Wellfleet or East Ham, and they are here in the school, and then when it comes time for the parents to do the FAFSA, you know, it, we all have this, this thing about getting kids into college here at Nauset, and we kind of really support and encourage kids to get a secondary education, post-secondary. And, um, and I've had a personal experience where there's been a kid who found out the end of her junior year that she's not eligible for any of the aid for anything because she is not here legally and she had no idea. I have to tell you, that was really crushing for her and uh, very unsettling because all of a sudden you're like a girl without a country. What do we do in cases like that? 
There are certain things that um, DACA does help um, support when it comes to um, financial aid and all these different scholarships and everything. Um, there are only about 10,000 out of the 65,000 um, DACA recipients annually who do graduate from college just because they got that financial aid and were able to get that kind of support. Support, yeah, thank right. you. And um, it is very dependent on the state that you live in, the school that you go to, or any scholarship organizations that you are going to to receive right. financial aid from. Um, do, do colleges and universities ask to see your status? Yes. Yeah. They do. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. okay, so they ask to see your status. So before you could actually even go to school, you have to make sure that all your paperwork is squared away. And if you didn't know that your paperwork wasn't squared away, and you don't have the parental units to actually support and help you with this, that can be a very bewildering process for kids, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, do you have anything to add? Um, I mean, I feel like part of the issue with the DACA program is, is that it expires after two years, and then you have to get it renewed. Ah, okay. So that can be hard for kids that, like, don't know what to do when they're going into the system and then they have to get it renewed every two years. They have to learn how to do that. And it can just be tough sometimes. Right, right. So every two years you have to renew up and everything. And, yeah. and uh, does it cost money to renew, do you know? Um, do you guys know about that? I believe it does, I'm not quite sure. I think it does, exactly. I know that the TPS thing fee. costs actually a fair amount of money and yeah. my friend who's Haitian has had to renew a few times and it's cost him a heck of a lot of money to do it. I'm just so grateful. You know, we take it for such granted that that didn't make sense. We take it for granted, um, you know, that we're citizens and we are secure in our citizenship. You know, I really have a lot of empathy for people that struggle around this issue. And it's really about empathy, isn't it? Because, you know, uh, we are a nation and it's one of the ways that we identify, self-identify, as a, as a nation of immigrants. Um, so it really, uh, uh, all the politics aside, really, it's more about building empathy in a lot of ways and really trying to put an uh, empathic program together so that it includes all, but it also weeds out the people who are um, here to uh, do us harm or here for nefarious reasons. This has been um, NASA Educational Tele Television, Diversity Television. My name is Lisa Brown, and we'll be right back. Hi, my name is Lisa Brown, and this is NASA Educational Diversity Television, Ned Raps. I'm here with a couple new guests right now, Tess Fu and Haley. Um, and we are talking about immigration, immigration reform, and the history around immigration and some of the issues that we're facing today. Um, I wanted to finish up the program by just asking you guys, um, your research was really looking at what are, now we're getting political a little bit, what are the Democratic and Republican platforms on immigration and immigration reform, and what can we expect to hear from our two parties um, coming up in this new election, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what do we have here? What, what, who wants to start? Um, so the Democratic platform definitely is catered towards immigrants. Uh, they definitely feel that they have a right to come to this nation if they are law-abiding uh, law citizens, good models, good representatives of their nations that they come from, and just uh, pose to be good part of the community. Uh, they also feel that DREAMers also have a right. Uh, Barack Obama created and established DREAMers in order to allow people to come into this nation while also having a limit to how many people can come into this nation. So I really think the Democratic Party is just the most fair and understandable uh, platform. Okay, so, so they're looking at, um, do you have any specifics about the reform at all? Or, or is, you know, is that just really their general stance? Um, so on the democrats.org uh, website, they just have a general platform idea and their concepts are straightforward. So they do believe that immigrants 
should be part of this nation, and they are going to work against Trump and do everything they can. Okay, so interesting. So you're you're representing the Republican side. Uh, when Tesfu says work against Trump, what is what does that mean? And or let's talk a little bit about what the Republicans, what yeah. the stance is on the Republican side. So on the Republican platform, uh, they do say that they appreciate legal immigrants, especially those in the military. So they give a thank you, but they are known for kind of being against immigration in ways. They say that Obama was blind to the problem that was happening, and this is all on their platform. And they believe that citizens, uh, their jobs should surpass the needs of immigrants, legal or illegal. Okay, so let me just tease that out a little bit more. Meaning that people who are in this country now should always take precedence over immigrants that come into the country? Yes. Is what that is saying? Okay, yes. I just wanted to make clear what that meant. Okay. Yeah. And okay. there is a belief that Americans are in danger by illegal immigrants, either physical or just by jobs and opportunity. And in a time of crime, human trafficking, and terrorism, there should be secure borders, which would mean that this is, you know, their main uh, aspect that they're working towards is the southern border and the wall that they want to create. And this would stop vehicular and pedestrian crossing. I'm going to stop right there for yeah. one second. Um, one thing that I know that is kind of ironic just about this a little bit um, is that where there is a market, that market gets filled. So as far as sex trafficking, we are the biggest consumer of sex trafficking in the world. Um, that's unrefutable and it's a statistical fact. Um, as far as drugs, we are the biggest consumer of drugs in the world. So um, we probably need to clean house internally a little bit too uh, before we externalize some of our issues. We need to take care of what our domestic issues are, which is uh, sex trafficking is terrible here, and uh, so is drug use and abuse. So I just I want to disclaim that a little bit because uh, we tend to externalize um, the blame, and it's actually we need to clean our own house a little bit around that, um, and that's on both sides of the aisle. Okay. Um, so some of the systems that they want to put in place is to bring back the SAVE program, which is systematic alien verification for entitlements. And so that's pretty much making sure that illegal immigrants do not get government funding because they are legal and haven't gone through the process of becoming a citizen or just being legal. Um, they believe they, they shouldn't be funded in any way. And they also want to work more with Homeland Security, and this will uh, keep the streets safe and to make sure that there's uh, not more crime being brought in by illegal immigrants. And the SAVE program is actually already, or it would be Im implemented in the workplace. And also biometric tracking would be used. So this would be so um, in airports or in border crossings, they could see when an immigrant entered the country and when they left the country and if they left the country this would be used for either visiting or for someone who wants to have a visa and this is already implemented in a, uh, 115 airports and border crossings already so they want to bring that uh, to the forefront and make it more prominent so um, so do you have anything more on the on the Democratic side as far as um, what the democratic platform is besides just saying that um, that we're a nation of immigrants um, that we should be welcoming immigrants um, do they because it sounds to me like the Republican side is very specific about how they would uh, deal with about how they see the problem or problems and how they would deal with them does the democratic platform have anything specific about it or um, I definitely feel that they do have specific aspects to their platform. Um, the Republican Party has many platforms and new ideas and laws that they're trying to create. 
but I believe that they're not really backed and strong enough as they are painting a false image on these immigrants. Many of the immigrants that are coming, which are by the millions, are not just drug dealers and killers and stuff that Trump is tweeting and stating that they are. So it, it's painting a false image and creating a false propaganda in a way. So it's hiding and changing the image and the idea while you should be focusing on helping immigrants and showing them how to become a legal citizen and how to become a good community, community member. So it sounds to me like immigration reform, regardless of whether you're Democratic or Republican, that there needs to be some kind of very clear understanding about how we uh, move forward in this political atmosphere around immigration and immigration reform. Uh, it looks also to me, as we look back at the history of immigration, that it expands and contracts depending on which way the pendulum swings. So that being said, uh, that wraps up our program on immigration. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Honors Erd class. It's been really fun working with you. Uh, my name is Lisa Brown. This is NASA Educational Diversity Television, or NED Raps. See you later. <laughs>